idea of like, a, you know, like we smack a, a an ant or something. You smash an ant, and mm -hmm. that ant has no no idea what. There's no way that ant could possibly comprehend what has happened to it. Like when or when that you know you have a line of ants going into your sink or whatever. Right. That line of ants, they can't comprehend what you are. Like you walk by the line of ants. They have some instinct maybe to run away from you. A lot of times they don't even run away from you. You turn the sink on, kill like 30 of them in a second, but they don't, they can't, they're, they're they, whatever way they use to think, they can't process it, right? So death to that ant, it, it's going to be processing its extinction in some way that we can't even understand, right? So there's this idea, my friend was telling me that in the same way when a human dies, what we process is like, oh yeah, he got in a car accident, man. What really happened was some kind of like hyper-dimensional event that we can only see one tiny piece of that looks like a car accident. In our, the way our minds process the thing being wiped off the face of this dimension is by like, oh, car wreck, car wreck. But really, there's like all these other levels involved. So it's like maybe some hyper-dimensional entity just squashed your friend. And the way it manifested is like, oh, a car wreck. It was a car wreck. But really, no. That's just the way our brains process that event from where we're at currently in the uh, in our ability to like comprehend reality. People who listen to this going, does that mean I can text and drive? <laughs> Texting and driving is easy. It's fine. No, that's that's the, what they when they see you doing that, they smash you. Hmm. You know? Maybe it's just an accident. What? Maybe Death? It's, it's like okay, human existence up until the point of flight was turret was completely based on like getting like you would climb a mountain and then you could see the ground like you're from an airplane but that's pretty much it climb up a tree i guess you get some altitude you can see this whole new perspective on what things look like from a high place but you certainly couldn't get the perspective of flying through the air and looking down at all this stuff that formerly in front of you is like looming over you it's like when i uh you know, I have two little dogs, adorable, adorable little babies, but you pick them up and like, for you, it's no big deal. But for that dog, it's seeing what's on top of the fucking counters, man. It's like, doesn't see that usually. It's looking up at everything. So it transforms its reality a little bit. So mm. flight transformed human reality in this intense way. And now the satellites floating around our planet have transformed it even more. Because we see, oh shit, yeah, we're on a planet. We're like, it's a ball that we're floating around, or a flat Earth, or whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but the uh, so in the same way, the next, the next sort of liftoff is to somehow rise above the time-space continuum, so that time itself becomes an object instead of a thing that we're stuck inside of. That's like the next big liftoff, and that there are already things that are see time as an object instead of as a river that we're currently being rolled around in and for them we look totally different so that's like the next that's what like maybe mckenna was talking about the idea of the time machine or the singularity or whatever is that like once we figure that i know there's never going to be a fucking time machine. i know it's insane but the theoretically it's possible you know people do say it. it it could be possible like there's no necessarily there is no reason for us to be stuck in the current way that we are i mean obviously for where we're at right now this isn't a feasible option right but if it's possible and we exist in an infinite universe then why wouldn't things have potentially figured out a way to to get beyond the time space continuum so like you know we're looking for aliens inside of time and space or you know but maybe there's like the thing we should be that we're looking for we don't even have the technology to scan outside of past present and future because that's what we're in right now these things are like way outside of our understanding of what um of what this even is we can't even fucking see them like the ants can't see us like we can't even see yeah. them we couldn't talk to them an ant can't talk to you they put these people they put them uh, they attached them to like this uh this rope and then uh they made them stand like connected to this pole and they covered them with bees like covered them Ugh. from head to toe with bees and they had to stand there for a certain amount of time some people didn't get stung at all. It's really interesting. Like, this guy really knew. Some people got stung. I got stung just for being around them. 
but this guy really knew how to take care of these bees. He's really like I was covered in bees at one point in time. And you just like, stay calm, and he eventually blows them off you with smoke and yeah. shit. Anyway, while they're doing this, he's got his own. He's a beekeeper, so he's got his own hive. This local group of bees came over, and they met in the sky above us. And all of his bees went up to talk to all those bees, wow. and he said, "We got to get out of here." We have to stand back and let them work this out. We have to stop filming and stand back and let this work, us work this out. So it was me and uh, my friend David Hurwitz, who was uh, the producer of the show. We were looking at each other like, they're going to talk it out? Like, what the yeah. fuck? And we're sitting there watching these bees above us just yeah. getting together. And they were literally trying to sort out who these new bees were, what their plans How'd were. How'd you get on Fear Factor, man? <laughs> Can you get me on that show? <laughs> Wait, what? Did you was this agent. SAG? Are yeah. you in SAG? Or do you, that's crazy, dude. That's crazy. Yeah, it was really interesting. And it lasted for about a half an hour, if I remember correctly. They talked it out for half an hour, and then the other bees went their separate way. And then everybody figured out, everybody knew where everybody belonged. Right. Like those tiny little itsy-bitsy pinhead brains had decided these are not their friends. These are their friends. Yes. This is where they belong. They're yeah. in this traveling hive. Yeah. That for some reason is in the middle of Santa Clarita right now. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. I mean, all the levels of communication happening around us at any given moment are, it's astounding. We can't deal with it. Like, it's just too much to handle. So we sort of get focused on our own little lives as human beings or whatever. But fuck, man, there's a lot more going on. I mean, just that. Yeah. You know, that if that's happening with bees, there's then it's probably happening with everything. And so then we're in this, like, and we talk about this a lot, but that means we really are in a matrix of intelligence, and we've just decided to focus on this one the way that we're doing it right now, you know, which is a pretty, uh, it's sad in a weird way, because we do, you do cut out, you cut yourself out of a whole other uh, community. That's one of the things I like about, like, the Native American mythology is that they, uh, you know, it seems like they had less of a distinction between humans and animals. It was like, these are our brothers, so, too. Take it from the human level. Okay. You, A lot of people, they don't even mean to be, but they're snobs, right? So they'll see... Human snobs? Human snobs, right? So a human snob is exclusive, right? So they have this exclusive relationship with the world where they allow into their periphery or in their their circle of friends i'm letting you into mm. my circle of friends mm. so i have this like tight circle of friends and then other people based on whatever their particular metric is for determining who they want around them you know shit snobs are the ones who are who happen you know those people who happen to only be friends with successful people it's like they're only friends with like like celebrities mm. and they're only for like weird that a weird coincidence how did that happen <laughs> holy shit i don't understand how that happened you know so there's that which is like for them they want to interact into in this particular like part of the societal ecosystem which means they're excluding 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 all these other fucking people right right and so the moment you stop you're you start experimenting with not excluding people as much as you can this doesn't mean you let annoying people around or people who have their don't have your your the good intentions with you around or whatever you sound like you're giving advice to stuck up hollywood elites no i'm giving advice well, <laughs> just not it's not just in hollywood it's, it's like it's a it, the elites in general there's actually some book i heard about i didn't read it it's a really cool idea though which is like the galapagos islands here we have these beings that have evolved in a certain way because they're completely separated from everything else it's fascinating to see so in the same way there's a kind of economic galapagos that happens with wealthy people which is that they only get around each other and so they start mating within their own circles and they mm. start ch exchanging only information that wealthy people have and so this creates a kind of hybrid a, a weird new form of human being which is the elite wealthy class not a new idea the kings and queens would only like fuck within bloodlines and stuff I mean, it was an intentional form of like wealth eugenics or something but so uh but anyway what ends up happening when you're doing that is uh you end up cutting off all these other forms of information that come in and then also you start living according to a pretty ridiculous fucking idea which is that all these other people whatever they're doing whoever they are whatever it is you know that's just not really worth it like what does that person really 
have to tell me that I need to hear, you know? Is that what it is, or is it that they feel like they can get along with those other people because the other people are going to understand them? Because people do find like-minded groups of people and hang out together. And if you're like some super wealthy Rothschild guy, yeah. and you become friends with some weirdo painter dude... I mean, how much do you guys have in common? It does. You, know? you have so much in common. Oh, so much. Do you in really? Co- fuck yeah, you do, man. You have the human condition. Mm. You have the fu- gravity. You're both dealing with a gravitational field. You're both in a fucking body that's goddamn melting down with the progression of time. You're uh, you're probably gonna have to. Both of you are gonna have to bury your mom. You're gonna have to bury your dad. You're both. There's so many. Sure. There's things. a lot of things you have in common, but yeah. they would have to completely open their mind up to accept all these things. That's and it. So you have to change the way a person thinks. And you have to change, in essence, who they are, right? And some people just don't have any desire to do that. Well, there's the problem. And what's even worse is when that is, uh, it, when that kind of idea is the f- that is like encouraged. When that's like looked at as like, oh, this is just a totally normal way to be. Yeah, country just, club. So that exclusivity, even uh, from a human perspective, cuts you off to all these, a lot of data. Admittedly, some of that data is probably going to suck, but a lot of the data is going to be really fucking good information that can make your life better. Stuff's going to come to you that you would never expect when you stop being, ex- uh, 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 when you reduce yeah. your exclusivity. So in that same way, humans as a species are exclusive, right? We are, we place ourselves as the top of the food chain human beings and underneath us is all this all the, this incredible biomass filled with all these other forms of life that we have managed many people have managed to reduce to being some kind of meat machine or vegetable or vegetable exactly or that's, plant life that's or it. whatever it is it's all life it's all life and 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 anytime you start talking about like i i'm not positive about this but I feel like I can communicate with this plant in some way. Like when I'm watering my plants, I swear to God, man, yeah. some little piece of me is like, I think they know I'm watering them. Like yeah. I think there's an awareness here. Going back to what you were saying earlier about ants and the system that ants live under in bees, how these bees can communicate with each other through pheromones and some other way. I mean, I don't know exactly how they're sorting out who's who and which yeah. which clan belongs and what part of the woods or you know who the fuck knows but the thing that we know about human beings is that there are signals that are around us constantly that we can't detect right wi-fi and radio and television and satellite all that stuff is broadcasting around us through the air around us constantly and we can't detect it right and we also know that all throughout nature are these animals that are blind, there's animals that can't see, there's worms, there's all sorts of things that have no idea you're there, no idea that you're watching television, and there's no, no idea that you're about to get in your car. They don't even know what the fuck a car is, because yeah. they don't have the senses to detect it. Yeah. Why would we assume that we hit the fucking bonanza with the senses and we've got it all down? I don't it's know. It's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. There's probably, like... I mean, I don't know what those quantum physicist guys are up to. I think, didn't they say they, was, they were up to, like, they believe there's more than 30 different dimensions now? Yeah. They used to think it was 11, and now there's some schools of thought that it's, like, 30 dimensions. Yeah. Who the fuck knows? It could be infinite. But the point is, the, these could be worlds right. that are in our in our midst. Yeah. They're just in a non-physical sense. That's the it. same way ideas are non-physical, the same way imagination is non-physical, yeah, right. the same way like, you know, cer- certain forms of communication, you're just saying something to someone, right? I'm yeah. looking at you, I'm telling you I love you and you're my friend. Yeah. It's a non-physical thing, right. but it gives you a physical reaction like, "Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I love you too. I'm yeah. glad we're friends." That that's some sort of weird non-physical energy exchange. That's right. It's not just as simple as, you know, oh, two people showing affection for each other, two friends no showing each other love. There's something else going on too. That's it. Yeah, there's a there's an energy exchange. There's both people get happy. When I tell someone I love them, I get happy too. Yeah, they get happy. The whole everybody boosts up. It's like a very underrated thing, telling your friends that you love them. Yeah, oh, it's shocking. Like, when you're not even supposed to do it. But, like, again, because we live, this is, I mean, so much of what we live in is, like, very advanced, but so much of it is, like, ridiculously barbaric and primitive. Oh, yeah. That to tell your friend you love them can be a shocking moment. I think we are love. And and the, the thing that I've been thinking lately or just playing around this idea is, like, what if... 
uh, I have all these different versions of it, and I don't quite know the right way to get it out. But like, so imagine like directly behind you is a window that opens up into a universe where everything's made of love, right? And you're standing in front of the window, blocking that light, right? You're standing in front of the window. And so like the human condition, again, this is just a thought experiment and admittedly a very high thought experiment that I had, but I can't get it out of my head. So, and I've heard Ram Dass give different versions of this too. But the, so the idea is like, here's this window opening up into this alternate I don't even want to call it an alternate universe, the actual universe. I guess it's kind of like Plato's allegory of the cave too, but you're standing in front of this fucking window blocking the love. Your ego is, right? Your ego is. And so the more opaque your ego becomes, the more you allow yourself to become less and less of a thing stuck to anything at all, the more the light from that universe shines into this one right so when you're with someone who's like i love you i really love you they've gotten over their ego enough to let the light from that window they've kind of like managed to let that light shine through them for a second into this dimension which is why it's so shocking and like maybe why babies are so entrancing because there's there's no ego there they're just a pure blast of love or dogs in the same way or cats or like anything that loves you is so incredible because what they actually are are like windows or portals into the reality of what our universe is which is love and so if you're blocking the window then that means that like you're mostly living in a world of shadows like a person who's like very egotistical is like living in a shadowy world Artistical point of view that we have that there's like a, a portal to another dimension and is it really just that these dimensions are constantly around us we just don't have the ability to access them like they're there all the time yeah maybe that's like legitimately why no one like the Fermi paradox you know the Fermi yes. paradox which is um, if there's so many stars and so many planets where are they all the aliens where's right. the fucking aliens um, maybe they don't maybe they get so smart that they never do that like maybe no one does that. Maybe we're we're like in this rudimentary thing. Like these stupid fucks are still they're still making metal dicks and trying to fuck the sky. Yeah. They're shooting rockets up into space. Yeah. And they're landing people on this. They're still doing it that way. Like they they lack the ability to transcend space and time and to just pass That's through other it. through other dimensions. It's like as a species, we're like a crazy person in a bus station staring at its at his hand and being like where are the aliens i don't see the aliens in my hand when it's like all he has to do is look up and he's surrounded by it and, well, and you know the ultimate mind fuck when it comes to the time travel right no the ultimate mind fuck when it comes to time travel is that one day they are going to have a time machine and it's probably likely it might take a hundred thousand years yeah right who knows how long think about when was the first tool like, what was it a couple hundred thousand years ago? That they, I don't know. I think it was. I think the first tools were somewhere around. Anyway. I have to look at my calendar. I'm not sure. Ah! <laughs> so, from the first tool to now, a couple hundred thousand years, I yeah. think. From now to a time machine, if we stay alive, if we don't blow ourselves up, we don't get hit by an asteroid, if we keep improving, yeah. they're going to figure it out. And the day they figure it out, what becomes crazy is then... All time travel from any point in the future to that moment is yeah. possible and to any place else on the scale. See, the idea is that you can only travel where there's a road. So once the time machine is invented, yeah. time ceases to be linear and everything happens all at once. Right. Like literally anyone can come back to any point in time and go back and forth. You could smack someone and then you go back in time before you smack them and kiss them and then go back in time and smack them and they'll go back in time and kiss them. <laughs> you could pull their pants down, you could pull yeah. their pants up, you yeah. could do whatever the fuck you, you mean. You literally could go back and forth in time and it would have never happened. Right. And you'd be communicating with the same person once it happens. So once it does happen and people have access to it, 
which that access, like everything else, whether it's cell phones or automobiles or anything, the access, the access starts in a limited way where very few people can afford it, and then it becomes worldwide. Did we talk about directed panspermia already as related to time travel? No, I don't think so. So it's like the idea... Directed that, panspermia, I mean intentional. Like, yeah, like it's, a, a, it's a tricky... Movie, Prometheus? Yeah, yeah, it's like, exactly. So the idea is like, okay... Uh, uh, I so I know this idea. We well, need the road to travel, so we need to build the road. So what's the so let's say I do invent the technology for a time machine, which basically means I have point A. Now I need a point B, right? So the point B, uh, I've got to get the I've got to get a, the further out the point B is. I guess the more the the more the, the more powerful the time machine would be, right? So. Right. This is the idea of directed panspermia as a means of uh, time travel is assuming you are the super advanced species, then what you do is you create these genetic, these, these like you, you create like DNA, you create a kind of packaged thing that when it lands in the right environment that you could live in has the tendency to evolve into a technological civilization that will build a time machine that is actually point B for your time machine. So you release from your planet just infinite blasts of this uh, DNA. And you know that when it lands on the road and then the seed finds the right soil, it's going to grow into a technological tree that at the end of its growth is going to flower with your point B, the end of your time machine. So if you were this kind of interstellar traveler, then for you, you would send these seeds out into time. And then the moment a time that they got to the point where they built a time machine, for you, it would seem like it happened instantly. There's your point B. You don't know what it's going to lead to, but uh, you know it's going to be a, at least a habitable planet because you've developed this, uh, these, these uh, genetic machines to only take root in a planet that you could live on. So what we are are these genetic robots that are compelled to build technology because we're opening up the point B in some kind of interstellar time machine. And that's what the singularity is. It's when our creator masters come through the time portal that we've opened up on this planet and say, oh, hi, you did it. <laughs> that, Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I just, it seems like it works. It seems so science fiction-y, though, that if we really got to a point, like imagine if our civilization had gotten to a point where we could transcend space and time and travel through the universe and, and go to any place at any point in time and even drop the seeds of life on a planet and sort yeah. of what is that that term that they were going to use on mars where they they uh what is it called what's the term where you take a terraforming planet and terraforming yes thank you and that they had done this like and then they're going to come back like the silver surfer and fucking like what? i don't think so i think we're them i think we are them i don't think there's anything else this is what i think and I think this is a ridiculous way to look at it, too, because uh, I don't know, and I'm talking shit. Sure, but, me too. But I think it is entirely possible that we're number one, meaning that we're the first. We're the first? We, we're the first of all these things to achieve this state. And that when these things achieve this state, they, they either blow themselves up or they keep going and they become more and more advanced. But I don't think it happens very often. And I might be wrong. I might be totally wrong. But it hasn't happened anywhere near us. So let's pretend that the galaxy that we look at right now that we can see, let's, let's pretend that's the universe. What if we find out that out of this galaxy, hundreds of millions of stars, we're the only intelligent life? Yeah. That drastically narrows the possibility for intelligent life everywhere else in the universe, except for the fact that the universe is infinite. Which means right. that not only is there intelligent life somewhere in the universe, there's a Duncan Trussell somewhere in the universe. Not only is there a Duncan Trussell, but there's a Duncan Trussell that said everything that you said in the exact same order. With every pause, every time you dribble piss on your toilet seat and you go, oh, I'll take care of that later. Yeah. And you shut the lid, it did that to the exact T an infinite number of times throughout yes. space and time. Right. So like not only is there one of you, but there's an infinite number of yous and then an infinite number of possibilities left and right that you could have gone right different paths you could sure. have taken like that's how big the universe is right. that's how big infinity is right but that doesn't mean that anything's ever gotten smarter than this this is the only thing that we know that's gotten this smart right and it might be this is the only thing that's got the smart because something had to be the first thing that got this smart it right. didn't have unless it happened simultaneously like we're saying 
then it happened with a bunch of things. But let's call that thing the same thing in different places. It's not like there's a gray alien with big black eyes and a giant head and a little skinny neck that reads your mind and flies through magnetic yeah. fields, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about you and I, this thing. This thing might exist an infinite number of times all throughout space right. and time, but let's call it this one thing. Right. This one thing, this might be the first time anything has gotten as advanced as this one thing. So it's like the term the simulationists are using is base reality, like this is base reality. Yeah. And the, the, the statistical probability of this being base reality is somehow, uh, it's more probable this isn't base reality. But yeah, it, it is a probability that this is base reality. And there's also a probability that this isn't base reality. Like we, you know, you get to roll the dice on that one. I, I, like, I, Who knows? I, who knows? I mean, it's impossible to, to really, like, at this point, we can't prove that this isn't the default base reality that the entire universe is experiencing. But. <laughs>